Hey, good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you from the Dolph Simons Family Studio. Delighted to be back with you on this great Monday morning with a snowstorm that came with us from Denver. But who cares? Because the Chiefs won. Mm -hmm. This morning we're joined by uh, Dana Hawkinson, Hawk Guy. We're back to talk to you about all things COVID. And we have two very special guests, Dr. Matia Salate, who's the Chair of Medicine and the Vice Chancellor for Research here at the University of Kansas. Delighted to have you here, sir. Thank you. And Dr. Akinololo Ojo, who is the Executive Dean of the School of Medicine and whose life has been in public health and has been one of the best, best funded ma men in America, best funded persons in America uh, for research <laughs> funding related to epidemiolo epidemiology and the public health. So we are really looking forward to discussion today about vaccine and the epidemiology of COVID. But first, mm -hmm. let's see if there are questions from reporters. All right, I'm not hearing any. I was sure we were gonna have one about capacity, but I'm sure that'll come up at some point. We're gonna be talking about that a little bit. All right, Hawkeye, how are the numbers today? Yeah. So they're better, you know, we're getting under 30. I think that's a good, good yeah. place to start for the week because we were above 30 last week. Uh, 29 patients in the hospital in the acute phase, nine of those in the ICU and four in the ventilator. We still have 37 who are in, in the hospital otherwise in that recovery period. And Hayes um, has 17 total patients in the hospital, 13 acute, and then uh, four in that recovery phase. And I should say that I did work this weekend, and on Saturday I had three new admissions for COVID, and I had one new admission yesterday. Um, one of my other partners had, had a patient or two as well. So it's happening. It was a young person, mid-40s to older people, uh, asymptomatic to significant symptoms of shortness of breath and cough and fevers and feeling bad. So it ran the gambit this this weekend. So COVID's out there and we're seeing a lot of rises about the statistics yeah. every day. I'm a little concerned, how about you? Yeah, absolutely, um, both nationally, but also in our community, um, in Kansas and Missouri and those states, and especially in the Kansas City area as well. I mean, it's concerning. We know that uh, the case numbers are going up. Um, there were new records reached, I think, for, for daily new cases. Uh, we know that that is happening and we know that there are individual community infection dynamics as well, but overall it is going up. Um, it is a concern because we are only now really getting into uh, the cold and flu season as well. Yeah, so big concerns. So, Dr. Salate, in your role as Vice Chancellor of Research, et cetera, talk to us a little bit about what KU's got going on for COVID research, what's going on in the community as far as vaccination. So the first two thing different is, questions. Yeah, yeah they're, there they're huge different questions. <laughs> and so what is going at, uh, on at KU? So we have basic science um, investigations in COVID-19, which are funded internally and externally through the NIH, which is important and hopefully translates later on or soon later on into clinical trials. Mm -hmm. But we're also now very active in NIH multicenter clinical trials, what's yeah. called the active trials. Mm -hmm. These are the accelerated COVID therapeutic interventions and so we have actually three of them running at KU, Active 1, Active 2, and Active 4. And they're all looking at different pathologies of COVID-19 in human beings and how we can potentially influence them and to get people better quickly or more quickly. Active 2 is actually now a patient trial with a monoclonal mm -hmm. antibody to infusion. You know, this is like not the Regeneron antibody mm -hmm. uh, that was famous because of President Trump but it is the Eli Lilly antibody, and that's going on. Plus, we're restarting the AstraZeneca vaccine trial. Yay! Yes. Mm -hmm. So good news so on both those fronts. That is correct. So the FDA has released that mm -hmm. trial again, okay. and so we're moving forward with that. And obviously, in the area, not at KU, there's the Moderna trial as well in the vaccine space. So Dr. Ojo, you've been around the world doing studies in epidemiology and the public health. What secrets, what advice do you have for us around COVID-19 and what can be done here in, in, in the Midwest and in, the, in, in America? So the basic prevention methods that we have are quite effective if we continue to follow them. And that is wearing the face mask, um, at all times uh, when, and whenever possible, uh, physical distancing and uh, very good hand hygiene. And of course, we are all hopeful that there will be a vaccine that will uh, be approved in the not too distant future. 
Thank you. Yeah, and so, you know, we were hoping for that vaccine. And interesting, Secretary Hargan was here last week, or Deputy Secretary Hargan from the HHS was here last week. He intimated that um, they look like they're having some early success. They're, they're, the, the preliminary data for both the vaccine and especially, as he pointed out, the monoclonal antibody therapy was encouraging. And um, how long do you think it would take us to effectively distribute a vaccine or be ready with an antibody therapy? Dr. Rojo, your thought. Yes, so the uh, all the four major vaccine trials are aiming to accumulate a total of 150 cases. And when they have done that, they will be able to determine how effective the vaccine um, is. And it, it is anticipated that those numbers will be achieved uh, hopefully by the end of the year, and then it will be possible to determine whether each of those four vaccines um, and whether they are effective. And so once those um, studies are completed with 150 cases to determine efficacy or even 100 cases when they will do the interim analysis, the production campaign for each of those vaccines is already underway. I believe that the information in the public domain indicates that 100 million doses will be available by December. I think it will continue to be a challenge for our public health uh, institutions to uh, distribute, administer uh, the vaccine to the uh, population. So, but the CDC has already started uh, preparation with public health departments across the country to make plans for the, the transportation, distribution, and administration of those vaccines. So it is possible that a significant fraction of the population will be vaccinated by the end of the first quarter of 2021. Dr. Salate, are you encouraged by the direction of the monoclonal antibody research and, and preliminary data that we're hearing about? So there are not that many preliminary data, but <laughs> so it's a sh it, it's a small part of of the real study. But yes, it's encour encouraging. But this is more anecdotal evidence right it now. It is anecdotal. So evidence. we have to be careful how we're interpreting this. But yes, it is encouraging, and a lot of people who actually got these infusions report that they're feeling better quickly. Mm -hmm. Let's see what the real data mm -hmm. show, right? Because we don't know whether they get infusions with the real monoclonal antibodies or whether they get infusion with placebos. Encouraging, we need the real data because without that we cannot really make so, a judgment. So Hawkeye, uh, Salate and Ojo obviously didn't get the right dress code memo because they came in in ties <laughs> know, and jackets and you and I are here like, I got my vest on, it's cold outside. You got your black shirt on, I don't know about that. You, you got to you gotta lose the black shirt on. No, it's, I'm just saying. It's navy. It's, it's, it's really dark. dark. It sends a tough message. It's I think really I'm. dark. It's just navy, dark so, navy. So what do you think, and I mean you, you look at this, you and I both look at this data every day, the yeah. rise in the number of cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's increased pressure on mm -hmm. hospital beds mm -hmm. in Kansas City. We see that throughout the country. Yeah. Field hospitals are going up in Wisconsin and in Utah. Is that coming our way? You know, we have to believe that there are these different waves that go throughout um, the nation during this infection. We've seen it um, already play out with New York and Chicago and Detroit, uh, Louisiana. We've seen it move uh, west, and we've also seen it move from the south to the north. So I think there are going to be continue to be those things. And just as Dr. Ojo said, it goes back to continuing to do those things that we've talked about, those simple measures. Uh, it should become a culture change, the distancing, the not meeting in large groups, the masking whenever possible. I think those are important things to know. Um, we should note that uh, with those higher numbers, we know that hospitalizations lag behind infections. So if you have more and more cases, even though 80 to 85 percent of the people will never have to seek medical care, that other 15 percent, that uh, percentage becomes a large raw number of total people that are going to go to the hospital. And even the small percentage of people that go into the ICU, that uh, raw number will be greater because of the pure numbers of more infections as well. I, I know there are, no, there are the, I believe the number is there is a 30 percent or 35 percent increase 
and the number of COVID positive patients in the United States compared to two weeks ago. Yeah. That's a big number. That's huge. I don't like that. Okay, Jill, what kind of questions do we have out there? Okay, so our first question is from Isaac, and Isaac wants to know, he understands that vaccines will be given in phases. Mm -hmm. If he gets it first, can he go and visit someone, a family member, and have dinner with them and, and be safe? Well, that's a great question. We'll, we'll kind of go around the horn here, but the first thing, Hawk, is if you get the vaccine, it's not like you get the vaccine and you're suddenly not infectious to anybody. Correct. It takes a couple of weeks for yeah. that vaccine to really roll in and, and have its effect. Yeah, there's different endpoints for the studying of these vaccines and vaccines in general. You know, does it stop you from getting infected? Does it stop you from having any aspects of the disease, any symptoms whatsoever? And does it stop you from being able to transmit the disease? We don't know all that information yet. Um, there could be, even if you get the vaccine, you may have mild or no symptoms, but you still have the possible potential to spread the disease. So that's an important thing to know. And we don't know that. Again, those are some of the other points of data that will come out um, probably prior to the vaccines being released, but also, of course, in studying the vaccine um, after it's been released as well. That's from your standpoint about that same fact. Well, and the effectiveness is important as well. Yeah. Right? These, these trials are right now geared to have a 30% effectiveness. Mm -hmm. That is not a very high confidence to not get the disease, even if you were vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful. We know, need to know the data to make these recommendations in, in a better way. But it will take time. Some vaccines actually need two injections at least. Mm -hmm. We don't know how long they last, and we don't know how effective they will be. A lot of answers to be gotten here mm -hmm. there before are a lot we of can make any recommendations. I think if everything works well, you get a vaccine, you wait a couple of weeks, you're much safer to go out in the public. But in the meantime, um, you still got to follow the rules of infection control. And even when you go out in public, you got to follow the rules of infection control. And so I think we're in that time of the year where there's so many, so much illness out there. There's rhinovirus, right? There, there, there's still influenza. You got to make sure you get your flu shot. There's, there's all the other coronaviruses besides mm -hmm. the one, SARS-CoV-2, that causes COVID-19. Mm -hmm. All those things are out there. So we just have to take those rules of infection control and take them with us wherever we go. Jill, next question. Yes, Gretchen wants to know, to that point about e e efficacy, I guess is the word, um, she wants to know if it's not 100%, if a vaccine's not 100% effective, um, mm -hmm. is it going to protect me? What, what percentage mm -hmm. is a good percentage? We don't even know that because we don't yeah. know how effective it is. It's hard yes. to know, don't you think? Well, the, me the measles vaccine is highly effective, right? It's 99%. Yeah. Yeah. But we don't really expect that to be the case right now for the coronavirus vaccine. I would wish that it were that way, but there is no good answer to this question. Right? Anything protective is better than nothing. But again, from a public health point of view, if you do not have a highly effective vaccine, all the masking and the social distancing shouldn't go away, but you're safer than you were before without a vaccine. Dr. Ojo, yeah. do you see a future with vaccination and, and time, perhaps, and antibodies where masking will not be required as much as it is today? Yes, I see that future, and that is not likely to be until maybe the fourth quarter of 2021 or maybe even 2022. It is going to take time to penetrate the fraction of the population that is necessary to achieve herd immunity. And until then, we will need to continue to use all those other important preventive measures. Yeah, so it could take a while, but I do think there is real hope out on the horizon. What do you think, Hawk? Yeah, again, I think it's a combination of things. Um, uh, Dr. Ojo talked about masking. You know, I don't think masking will change in the hospital or the healthcare setting ever, uh, but certainly in the general public. But I think that it's going to be a combination of also having the culture change of doing what we can. We all want to get back to Arrowhead and a packed stadium. Um, doing what we can from the gathering standpoint, the meeting standpoint. Um, we will be doing what we can from a masking standpoint, but also the therapeutics and the vaccination. And there will be new therapeutics coming uh, through, whether it's the direct 
antiviral drugs, whether it's any monoclonal antibodies, where it's the first, second, or maybe third generation of vaccination as well. So it's very early in the process, but uh, we will move forward through this. Yeah, I think that's right. And I'm going to be more optimistic than the others here because I think once we have effective therapy, this is also a game changer. And I think it may be able to hasten some of these other timelines mm -hmm. because we're able to treat this disease effectively and then it becomes a lot more like influenza. So. But I want to say something. I knew you'd go against that. <laughs> so Solitai and, and I have known each other for many years, as it turns out. Go ahead. T talk to us over here, too. Don't forget yeah. us. Yeah. No, it's... I think it's important to say it is not a doomsday scenario. Even if it takes another year mm -hmm. and we do the right thing, we can go together through this and actually control the infection. So it will take a little bit more time. I know patient, people and patients are anxious to go back to normal life. We all want to do that. If we do it responsibly, we'll actually be there much faster. Yeah, I think that is right. I, we all have a good, he healthy case of the cows, COVID weariness syndrome. And the, the problem is that, in, in, in that, that term's made to just make a little bit of fun of it because that's sort of my nature. But, but in the long run, what we're trying to do is stay safe so that when we get to the other side, we're all at Arrowhead Stadium. Yeah. Yeah. And the person to your left and the person in front of you who have who've been in those same seats maybe for years are still there with you. And the way we do that is we take care of each other. Okay, Heather wants to know, what will the effect of the vaccine be on people who have long-term effects of COVID already? Will it help those problems? That's, well, that's a really great question. Hawkeye, what do you think? What will affect that long-term? I, I believe that if you are a long hauler, if you have residual effects from getting the disease itself, I'm not sure the vaccine is going to have any um, cause any improvement in those things. It's a yeah. different mechanism. You're looking, the vaccine is to protect you from new infection or uh, disease. But really, if you've already had the disease and you have those effects, which are really probably accumulation of that immune dysregulation or that inflammatory response in your body in general, it's not gonna have really any effect on those. Yeah, and it won't make it worse. Right. I think it, it, yeah, it, won't. Yeah, it will make it worse and because those are two different things, as you've pointed out. And it may actually protect you from another insult from COVID-19. And as a result, that could help protect you, too. Because we know, uh, Dr. Ojo, and people that have had long-term effects of a disease, you don't want to get that disease again. No, you don't. And it, we, there will be a lot of questions that will be answered during the post-marketing surveillance after the approval of this vaccine. And we will learn uh, quite a bit about the, to be able to answer those type of questions as to the effect of the vaccine on those long haulers and other population groups that may not fit the general mode of the population with respect to vaccine efficacy. Okay, so you're going to help me with this one, but Virginia wants to know, along that line, what is the difference between a cytokine storm and a Bradykinin? Brady uh, Bradykinin storm, okay. And for those of us who can't even say the we're, word, we're will you talk, tell us what they that. are? Yeah, so cytokine storm and Bradykinin mm -hmm. storm. Um, Hawk, do you want to try and go through that? You and I can talk a little bit about that. And yeah, and luckily we had um, the wonderful Dr. Gear on here to help us with the bradykinins. So cytokines are just simple, um, not simple, but they're chemicals, very small chemicals in your body that your cells release in response to different uh, insults such as infection, such as viral infection. Um, cytokines have been around, obviously, for millions of years. They're a part of the immune system. The bradykinin is more of a, um, some somewhat other of an inflammatory cell that, or inflammatory um, molecule that mostly deals more with um, capillary leak and uh, fluids, essentially. It, it's not really the same signaling. Um, it's not utilized in the same way as the cytokines. There have been uh, theories and evidence that you have this cytokine storm or this overactive immune reaction uh, at one part during the infection. Usually it's in the later stages. Um, so that is being looked at right now. The bradykinins are, are more about the, the fluids in your body, whether it's um, leak of the fluids into your lungs or out of your uh, blood vessels in some other manner. So thought, anything you want to add to that, Dr. Ojo? Dr. Ojo, Chief Dr. Solitaire. <laughs> no, and, and we don't know really which ones are the most important yeah. one, right? Because we're trying to treat those different storms but so far, the evidence is not clear what's really helping. Yeah. And I think the, the biggest thing to say is, you know, it's in it, 
inflammatory or immune dysregulation or an exaggerated inflammatory spot response, it's really difficult to uh, pin down cytokine storm specifically because there was a good uh, JAMA article looking at your cytokine levels compared to other people who have ARDS or respiratory distress for another reason. And those cytokine levels were actually higher than they are in patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection and cytokine storm. So I think just immune dysregulation, exaggerated inflammatory response, something of that nature. Cytokine storm is okay, but that doesn't say, that doesn't give us the whole picture. If, the way I would look at this, and this is overly simplistic, yeah. um, if, if you were to get um, uh, an insect bite and your skin got all swollen, and things were, and you had itches, and it turns red, you get a big welt there, and all of a sudden you're like, yeah, what the heck happened to me? Imagine that going on inside your lung. Imagine that going on inside your liver and your kidneys and your brain, because there's these same kind of chemical mediators. Just as you get an insect bite, your body releases substances to go in and try and prevent mm -hmm. that venom from causing more damage, but it causes a lot of inflammation right around there. Imagine millions of little insect bites throughout your lungs and your body responding with these different things, these different mediators, etc. Our problem is that our ability to turn that off medically when it gets out of when it goes kind of haywire, which can happen when you have too many of those little bites inside your lung. If you can think of it like that, think about what happens and so how do we turn it off? Well, we don't really do well turning it off. And our tools for turning it off are really big sledgehammers, and it's like steroids. Steroids are a big, big old sledgehammer, and we just start, but steroids have all sorts of side effects. We try and deal with some of the after effects of that, which include clotting of the blood, and so we try and give, put, put people on blood thinners. We try to make sure the virus is being killed, and that's why we use the remdesivir. And then we try to give you plasma or antibodies to try and prevent furthering of that whole kind of swelling and et cetera throughout your body. Each of those, unfortunately, is not a precise tool. In this case, they're blunt instruments. And so you have to worry about the side effects of those tools, as well as the ongoing swelling throughout your body, so to speak. It's, an, it's not the perfect example, but hopefully that will help you understand what it is we're dealing with when you're in the hospital and you get that sick. Just think of that little insect bite occurring millions of times inside your lung and inside your body. And that's what we're trying to solve for, whether it's bradykinin or other factors inside our bodies that are releasing these chemicals. Again, bradykinin and cytokines are different things. You know, I was studying for boards last night, and, mm -hmm. and I mean, I'll tell you what, the advance in knowledge in the last 10 years about all these little signals inside our body is mind-boggling. But there are so many of them trying to figure out what's doing what to whom and when. It's a, it's, it's a tough chore. Okay. <clears throat> Now that we've completely confused the audience, let's ask the next question. Yeah, yeah. but you know what? The um, mosquito bite really helped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when you put it yeah. all together, like yeah. it really, good it really helps. See, I, I like that analogy. So there you go, little mosquito <laughs> yeah. bites inside. And I saw you nodding your head, so I was, yeah, we were right with well, you. Well, but you see Dr. Rojo, he's going like this. What does he think? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a good analogy. Yeah. yeah. It'll okay. suffice. Um, so conspiracy theory question. Mm. Jetta wants to know, I continue to hear that COVID was created and released. Is there any evidence that, that you as physicians have access to that confirms or denies that? Dr. Salte, have you heard anything about that? I hear no. conspiracy theories about mm. that, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but to my knowledge in the scientific literature, there is no evidence that this is a man-made virus. Correct. There is just nothing like that. In fact, the genome analysis of that yep. virus is, uh, clearly states it was yep. not manipulated. Yep. Therefore, I mean, from a human point of view, manipulated. Yep. It was a spontaneous occurrence of a coronavirus. So there is no evidence that this was true. At all. All right, let's just think about it. like the smallpox is a terrible virus, right? Man didn't make that. Smallpox is random brand for thousands and thousands yeah. of years. Well, now it's not, we hope. Measles is the same way, right? All these really bad viruses that are out there, Ebola, those are not man made viruses. They're all more deadly than SARS-CoV-2, Dana. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's no molecular evidence these were created. In fact, looking at the genome, uh, we 
if man or if humans create it, they would probably create it in a more simple fashion. So there's no evidence that there is, it was created um, in a lab. In fact, what they do see is it probably diverged um, from another type of corona, uh, another isolate of coronavirus, probably in bats um, in the mid you know 1900s. This was probably circulating um, in bats. Uh, this coronavirus was probably circulating in bats anywhere from the mid 1980s uh, till now, till when it jumped species. So um, that's the best evidence we have looking back at the genome and comparing it to other viruses. So there's no evidence that it was created in a lab and released. Dr. Ojo, in, in your travels around the world, what's the worst virus you've encountered in your career? Oh. <laughs> Um, Dean, you get the hard questions there, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it has to be the, uh, the polio. Polio virus, yeah. And again, not a man-made virus, but one that takes away your breath and, and then you die, and, and it, with a very high case, uh, case fatality rate. But, but with a great story on vaccines, right? Please. This was yeah. Polio was the breakthrough of vaccines mm -hmm. with life attenuated virus, right? That was not proven. Salk brought that and it was yeah. a complete success. So I want to encourage about that too. This was a unproven way of doing vaccines. In the corona vaccine space, we're doing the same thing. We're having unproven new methodologies, but they could be breakthroughs. And I think that gives us hope that this is actually really a good way moving forward. Well, and of course, since I'm, you know, I'm a Star Trek geek, the, um, if you remember the stories, they come upon some infectious disease, they manufacture it, and they vaccinate the entire crew, and everybody lives happily ever after, unless you're a Star Trek red shirt and you beam down to a planet of the cap, in which case your life is very short. But by and large, you, you, that's really the story. The lightning speed, and, and granted, on Star Trek, a couple of, took a day or two, but, but, but you know, the lightning speed, which, which whole new vaccine technology is being developed, Mm -hmm. is really a harbinger of where we are headed as a society. This is re a remarkable story to think we're going to have identified the virus, got the genome sequence, we're going to have vaccines in less than a year. That's, that, that is a remarkable story, people. Loretta is wanting to travel to Iowa with her husband to attend the funeral of their 36-year-old niece who died of ovarian cancer. Ouch, I'm so sorry. That's, that's bad. Loretta's husband is diabetic and has heart issues. She wants to know if they double up on their masks, she's suggesting a surgical and a KN95, and they wear goggles, is it safe for them to go? Cock. Yeah. You um, want to break all that down, <laughs> Iowa? Yeah, we'll break it down. I think it starts at what we all talk about. It's risk mitigation and assessing the risk. I don't necessarily know that you need to double up on the mask. I think if you want to have a KN95 mask or just a surgical mask, eye protection, driving up there, if it's just going to take you one day, one short trip to drive up there, you should be able to do that pretty safely, getting gas, getting drive through for anything to eat. Um, staying in a hotel is probably going to be safe if you can reduce uh, the time you're in the lobby around other people. Being at the ceremony may be your most risky thing, but if you can look to stay spaced from people, try and not to be uh, in the, uh, the enclosed space uh, indoors as much as possible, stay spaced during that time wearing your mask and your goggles during that time, you can reduce the risk as much as possible. But unfortunately, we see that during funerals, during church services, during weddings or parties, we can see spread of, of the virus. So just understand those things. Know your situation. Know your local environment, where you're at indoors, and if you can stay spread from people and reduce contact as much as possible during this, this horrible time, you can reduce your risk. I, I think that's the answer. I, I think with heart disease and other things, you're going to have to think real carefully about the travel, though. I mean, there is a lot, a lot of risk. Iowa is a pretty much a hot spot, but quite honestly, so are Kansas and Missouri, so are our urban areas. And um, I think you just, it's one of those risk benefit analysis. There is no right or wrong answer to this question. Well, actually, there is a wrong answer. Going up to Iowa <laughs> without infection control, eating in public, and sitting in a bar, that's a bad idea. But in terms of what you can do to prevent it, and then you just have to decide, is it worth the risk? There's not, and, and people want a right or yes or no answer to this, but, but the reality is there isn't. First of all, 
I'm sorry for your loss. That's a difficult loss and a difficult time mm -hmm. for that family. But 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 can you get up there and be mostly safe? You can, right? You can, as we've talked about yeah. in the, on the program before. You can get up there. You can travel safely. You can wear all these things. Wash your hands. Keep your distance. Try not to be around other people. Not spend a lot of time in any person's space. You can do that, and that is a relatively safe thing to do. Is it a higher risk than staying at home and, and, and staying there and, and not taking someone with heart disease, et cetera, out in public? Absolutely, right? Can't eliminate it. It is a higher risk. Um, is that risk worth it because of the emotional situation you're in? Only you can answer that question. Can you make it pretty safe? You can try. Um, I was tough, but then so is Kansas and Missouri right now. Terry's a nurse. She needs to go back to work for finances. She's also a diabetic and she's on prednisone. She has two choices. One, our local cardiology office that does procedures. The other is to travel as an, uh, be a traveling RN. One opportunity is in Atlanta in a pre-op area. Yeah, I would say the travel is definitely the worst of the two yeah. ideas. Just because A, it's travel and B, you don't know what the circumstances are and C, you can't really know it in advance well enough to control it. So I, I'm probably least about that option, Hawk. Yeah, I think you have to understand where you're going and what are the infection prevention practices there. Not only their systems, but really what is the culture um, with the employees as well. Because we know that things can be done very well um, when you're uh, forward-facing, working with patients, but yet if five or six people in the office are getting together for lunch in a small break room, that's not good practice. So understanding the overall systems, but also the practice of what's going on in that local area uh, is going to be the most important thing to understand about those two jobs and to pick your lower risk um, job or, or lower exposure uh, doing no, understanding those things. Yeah, that's how I would probably approach it as well if you have to go back to work. Special diabetes, prednisone is a harder combination, but do what you can to keep yourself safe. A lot of it's like that last question, what do you do to keep yourself safe? And there's really not a right answer or a wrong answer to this. And then I think it's the same story, though. It, people have to have an income. They've got to go back to their jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do that. Then how do you do it and how do you do it safely? Um, and I think, um, and I think that uh, wearing your your uh, your PPE and, and including the goggles, I think is the right thing. So I'll take that. Any yeah. other thoughts you have? No, that's a tough one. But you know, it's it's protecting yourself and making sure that your environment protects you as mm -hmm. well. Yes, it's not only you; it's the whole environment that needs to buy in. Right, and you have to have a good culture Correct. around that. Culture has to be yeah. strong. Yeah, and you know, again, I worked um, on the weekend. I had several new. Uh, COVID patients in the COVID ward, I felt protected and safe because I knew I could go back to my training, wear my eye protection, wear my mask, wear the gowns, do the appropriate hand hygiene. So understand those things as well. And I think, again, hospitals are the example. Yep. We keep people safe all the time on our COVID wards. <clears throat> We're not seeing huge outbreaks from people who have to work on a COVID ward. So mm -hmm. that's the hottest hotspot in the country, the COVID wards of a hospital, all these patients grouped together, our staff not getting sick there. Why is that? Good infection control principles. On the other hand, when do staff get sick? They get sick when they leave the hospital and they don't use that same, and then they're just like everybody else. So, Janice says, I don't wear glasses when I am shopping and wearing a mask. Can the virus enter through my eyes? Can the virus enter mm -hmm. through our eyes, Hawk? I think we've got pretty good proof. The answer yeah. to that is? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, a, one of the, it's the third mucous membrane. We have your mouth, your nose, and your eyes. Um, they are, uh, you know, immunologically um, protected sites, or uh, they don't have a lot of uh, uh, protection other than just uh, the, the fluid that's covering your eyes. Uh, you can have exposure to the virus, and then through the lacrimal ducts can go down to the sinuses and cause infection. So certainly, there was an observational study. I don't think it was done very well, and there were caveats to it, but suggested that maybe there is reduced risk for people who wear eyeglasses. Um, certainly, you are protecting some of your eyes, but it's not considered eye protection in the healthcare setting with just eyeglasses. But it may be able to reduce the risk a little bit um, wearing glasses. Obviously, you're wearing your mask as well. So um, again, in the healthcare setting, eyeglasses do not constitute eye protection. But um, there was an observational study out of China showing that maybe there was reduced risk of people who wore eyeglasses from getting COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. 
Morgan says, I tested positive for COVID and was sick for 14 days. At day 14, I got much better and I felt fully recovered for one week. Then my symptoms came back, shortness of breath. Could I have caught a second strain of the virus or is this the resurgence of symptoms after recovering for a week? That's Am a I great, gonna be a long mm -hmm. hauler? That's a great question. Lock, what yeah. do you think? Um, well, for reinfection, we are looking at looking into those cases. There have been a few published cases. However, so soon after your initial infection, I'm going to say no, that's probably not reinfection. Really, the quickest we've seen after an initial infection, and this is difficult because the isolates from the first infection and the second infection were both collected and their genomes were sequenced and compared to each other. Um, so we have very good evidence that these were reinfection. But the earliest reinfection we've seen is just after 60 days. For the most part, we think it's really going to be after 90, uh, 90 days, really pro before you can get a reinfection. We know that SARS-CoV-2 infection and our COVID-19 is a bimodal disease. You have the viral aspect first, where the virus is replicating and causing initial symptoms. The immune system comes in, decreases the replication, really kills or, or lessens the amount of virus in your body, but then it's that 7, 10, 12 day mark where you have that second inflammatory phase or exaggerated immune response. I suspect that recurrence of symptoms was probably more of a delayed immune response to that initial infection. I would also say that we have to be careful not thinking that that's necessarily a pulmonary problem. That could be a cardiac problem. Mm -hmm. And I would urge that, that, that listener, I think you need to consult with your primary care physician and get further evaluation because that's not the most typical story. And so I want to make sure there's not some other problem you're having as a result of the virus. Any other thoughts you would have with that, Matthias? No, I, I fully agree with that. Yeah. And I think it would be unfortunate. We understand there are other respiratory viruses going around. Uh, maybe it was a new and respiratory AKs, infection right. as yep, well. Yep, yep. And I, and I, but I would, I, I doubt it's reinfection at that right. point. That, that would yeah. be unlikely. Uh, I do think we have time for one more. All right. Uh, Lindsay wants to know, what is the average hospitalization stay of your recovering COVID patients that require longer mm. care after mm. they're out of the infectious period? Okay. How long are folks here and how long are folks who are in the recovering phase here? I don't have. Uh, so for our acute infections, I think David Wild was saying, you know, five to seven days is the average for our acute infections. For the recovery, I don't have a good answer on that. I know that I... I'm seeing a patient who now has been in the hospital for three weeks, never went to the ICU, was just on the floors, met that recovery definition, but has still been here for three weeks for one reason or another. So I don't have exact numbers. Or yeah, I thought it was that. 14 days for the recovering beyond okay. your acute infection, but we'll find that out and get back with you tomorrow. Dr. Ojo, what are you thinking as far as Thanksgiving for you and your family? I know your kids are, are out of town, and, and are you going to bring everybody home? Um, no, we are not going to bring everybody home. I think we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving virtually. Same for Christmas. I think these are not the times to be gathering uh, in any large numbers. Yeah, that's a, that's got to be a hard thing because you're you, you have wonderful kids and and I know they're all kind of scattered in different parts of the country. I think Michigan and the East Coast is that right? That's correct. Yeah, big thing. Marius, how about you? So we are not going to have a large gathering. Uh, the kids are coming, but mm -hmm. we know that they have been socially distancing mm -hmm. and mask wearing at all times, but no extended family. Yeah. Hawk? Yeah, Thanksgiving, um, probably nothing, probably staying here just with uh, the local bubble. Um, not going to uh, increase the risk of grandparents or, or uh, aunts and uncles. Uh, but possibly for Christmas, maybe seeing grandparents. Um, but again, we'll be distancing as much as possible, probably quarantining or isolating before, and possibly even getting tested before. Yeah, my uh, mother-in-law is 88, and she's at Bishop Spencer Place, and we're trying to find a safe way for her to come over or do testing of everybody, et cetera. And she's like, I'm not leaving. <laughs> I'm not going. <laughs> so I think they've done a great job there, and I think we're going to be a smaller crew. We usually have about 30, and this year I think we'll end up with about six. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, and, and my daughter coming from Chicago, she and her boyfriend will be tested before they leave Chicago and then drive down to Kansas City so they can be with us. So yeah. I think that that's how it'll be this year. And, and you know what? That's not what we like, but it is what we have. Uh, and I think we just have to realize that our job right now is to keep each other safe. 
Hey, tomorrow we've asked three experts from respiratory therapy to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on breathing and how they help patients. The impact on supplies to treat patients and what time has taught us in fighting this pandemic. It is National Respiratory Therapy Week and these folks are on the front line, in some ways the most front line of all of us and how we can make sure we keep each other safe in those settings. Hey, Emily sent in this photo from her veterinarian's office. It's true that pets and kids can do a great job of masking. They don't seem to mind. We can learn a lot from our furry friends. Hey, just also, if you watched the Chiefs game yesterday, if you saw Mahomes after the game, man, he had his mask yeah, on. As soon as the game was over, really head, 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 boom, he was wearing the mask. And I just wanted to say thanks because I think that is a great, a great message yeah. to give. You know, um, we have a couple of tips for coping. I saw this over the weekend. This came from um, folks at the University of Wisconsin, and we have unabashedly stolen that because they're really good. We all have cows, and I think we have to figure out how do we deal with this COVID weariness? How do we get through the next few months, especially until we have effective anticlonal, uh, monoclonal antibody therapy and vaccination here, which I think both of those will be life-changing events for us. The first thing is accept that life will continue to be tough for a while. You know, if we can accept it and say, okay, now I've accepted that principle, what do I need to do to still have fun? And that becomes the second tip, looking for activities new and old that will help fulfill you. I think that's really important. Okay, don't just mourn what you can't do. Think about what you can do. Then tip number three, and I really liked this one, expect less from yourself. Cut yourself some slack and give yourself some grace. Just know that you're not going to be in the same space you were in a year ago. This is going to be just different and that that's okay. Then number four, choose to move and make physical activity a priority. Even in the snow this morning, out walking the dog, got to do it. Got to move around because that really helps keep us safe. I did that. You did. You always oh, do absolutely. that. You're a good man. Then number five, yeah. avoid doom scrolling. Limit social media exposure and be mindful of the types of news mm -hmm. you consume. Again, hats off, University of Wisconsin uh, Health System. These are great tips. Go we Badgers. stole them. They're, they're right on target. And they're kind of what we see every day about following those pillars of infection control. And remember that now is not forever. Now is not forever. Helps on the way. We'll be here tomorrow. We'll see you then.